and I want to thank you all for being here and uh, as part of the session and, and having interest in the session. Um, you've had our introductions already, and um, I'm pleased to be joined by a very phenomenal panelist. Um, we have uh, Ms. Professor Hammond online, and she'll be joining us here shortly. Um, there was an image that we we're supposed to show, but if not, uh, Nakam um, acknowledged uh, Black History Month on his Twitter feed on February 1st. Um, and on February 17th, they honored um, the first black Supreme Court justice, uh, Justice Thurgood Marshall on the 17th. And so I just wanna say thank you to Nakam, not just for that, but for all of the other groups, minority groups, women uh, that we celebrate. It's a true testament to what we're trying to do as an organization in regards to diversity, equity, inclusion. I had the pleasure of being the first uh, DEI chair for NACOM subcommittee. And I think what you've seen over the past day and a half was uh, the fruits of that labor from many NACOM members. And that's our educational content um, that we have here today. Um, <clears throat> those who may not know, uh, Black History Month actually started as a one week event. It was Negro History Week. Uh, it started in 1926 by Carter G. Woodson. Woodson. He was a historian, he was a professor, he was an educator. Uh, he defied odds of that time. It didn't become a month until 1976, Black History Month. Um, and so many people think it was selected because it was the short month of the year. That is not the case. Uh, February was selected because it was it coincided with Frederick Douglass's birthday as well as Abraham Lincoln's birthday. And so that's why uh, we celebrate Black History Month. What you will hear today um, as, a, as, a, as an art form of what Jacob Lawrence captured. He captured the life of African-Americans in art and through justice. And you'll see a lot of that from our subject matter expert, <coughs> Professor Hammond here shortly. Um, what's interesting is he was born in New Jersey, but he made his home here in Seattle and he passed here in Seattle in the year uh, 2000. I want to tee it up before for Professor Hammond by, for those of you who attended our opening session when Justice uh, Gonzalez spoke, and he gave the story about how he, on the day of his uh, investiture as Chief Justice of the Washington Supreme Court, his seven-year-old son at the time and he and his family were walking up those, that hallway, and his seven-year-old son at the time said uh, that none of these justices on the wall, these portraits of former justices, look like us. And if you rem remember, Justice Gonzalez said that <laughs> one day they will. And he's actually walking that today. But he also ended by saying that art matters. And so that is the essence of this uh, session here today. Art, justice, and the African-American experience. And with that, if we can tee up Professor Hammond, she will get us started. Hello, Professor. Hello, and thank you so much, each and every one of you who have elected to be part of this particular session. I am so honored and I am so thrilled every time I get an opportunity to talk about Jacob Lawrence and his tremendous Herculean achievements at making us become aware of what I now am dealing with which is whole history, the whole history of America. And what I mean by whole history is, is that we are no longer going to deal with just critical race theory. We are going to deal with all of the gaps, the fissures, the erasures, the exclusions, the forgotten, the denied individuals. And what is so fascinating about Jacob Lawrence, born in Atlantic City, New Jersey, and arrives in Harlem around the 1930s, he becomes a child of the great migration, of the great, mi of the great, excuse me, depression. And he arrives in Harlem during a period known as the Harlem Renaissance. Now the image that you're looking at here is literally an image of what happened during the great migration where tens of thousands of African-Americans unilaterally with the urging of the black press moved north to urban centers for a better life. 
This is one of the many, many photographs that were recorded at the time and for decades literally forgotten. Jacob Lawrence arrives in Harlem and there he is in the white sweater. And he arrives and his mother is very, very concerned about his welfare after school. She does not expect for him to be running the streets and playing. So she enrolls him in the Harlem Art Recreation Center. The Harlem Arts Center was very, very important because it also was part of the Great Depression's initiative under Roosevelt to create WPA programs where they hired artists to teach and to create community centers for individuals to work and to help. So they at least, and this is a phenomenal period of time because for once they recognized artists were actually citizens and were entitled to a wage and salary for the work that they did. So here's Jacob Lawrence in the Harlem Art Center, working with two of the teachers and two students. And these are prints that they are making. He also spent a lot of time in the Schaum, what is now known as the Schomburg uh, Research Center for Black History and Culture. At the time, it was the 135th Street New York Public Library. But a man named Arthur Schomburg during the Harlem Renaissance became a book bibliophile and collected every book that he could find from the African diaspora and loaded it into this particular library. In order for individuals to read or understand about their history, this was literally the only place. So Jacob Lawrence and so many other artists, in fact, the woman that he married, Gwendolyn Knight, who was part of the great migration from the Caribbean, and she came from the island of Barbados. After they married, in years later, they would work in this library, which is an iconic force. So any of you who have never visited the Schomburg, do make a trip if you don't do anything else. This is a historic site with an amazing collection of books and photographs. So here's Jacob Lawrence, and he is a young, young artist with brilliant talent. Now here's the irony. Jacob Lawrence did not attend art school professionally. It was very difficult for artists to get into schools because of the segregation of the time. However, the artists who taught at the Harlem Art Workshop were very, very conscious of his, uh, maybe even you could call it precocious talent and vision. And so one of the first series he made was a series called This is Harlem where he looked around his community and he began to document what was going on in Harlem. You have to understand that Harlem was created at a time where realtors had built up this geographical site, thinking that white individuals would move uptown when the subway was built. The only problem was the subway had not been built beyond 59th Street. So here was Harlem beginning at 110th Street and upwards, and the apartments and the houses were vacant. So they had to recoup their losses. So according to the laws at the time, which technically forbid Blacks to live in certain communities, the realtors had to let down and allow for Blacks to move in because here were hundreds and thousands moving, not just Harlem, New York. There were Harlems in Chicago, in Cleveland, in Washington, DC, in Detroit, in Boston. Blacks found places to live beyond the South. This is Jacob Lawrence. He's a young man. He's about 23 years old. By the time he's 23 years old, he has already completed at least five series that address historical individuals. This is the early, late 30s and the early 1940s. Nobody is really thinking about this in the scope that Jacob Lawrence is thinking about it. He is a masterful historian. He is an acute observer. He is looking under every rock, every cranny, every area where you can possibly find people who have been forced into slavery, grew up in the South, 
living in a rural terrain who find themselves in an urban setting and then all of a sudden have to recreate their whole lifestyle. So as African-Americans are, we are innovative, we are inventive, and we are improvisational. He began to look at how they were living their lives and recording it in his work. By the time he was 23, he had completed series on This is Harlem and Frederick Douglass series and the Toussaint Le Overture series and the Harriet Tubman series. But it is the migration series that really was his tour de force. The migration story began to literally document how people were walking when they could walk or as in the first photograph, an old car loaded up and go forward. Now, how did he learn how to paint? This is a fascinating story. You don't always have to go to art school to begin to have your talents be developed. What these artists did at the Harlem Art Recreation Center was that they gave him materials. They said, here, Jake, try this. Here, Jake, look at this. See what you can do with this. And slowly but surely, Jacob began to develop his own style. And these artists recognized that he was already on the path of genius. Here, beautiful composition at the train station, Chicago, New York, St. Louis, all of these amazing cities that were burgeoning with this new phenomenon of, um, of, of emerging urbanization. And these individuals swarmed to these locations because they were looking for a better life, a better way to live. Oops, sorry. And here, more walking, carrying their belongings in bags, in sacks, okay? Leaving, and you'll notice that the land is barren. Why is the land barren? Because even though slavery is over, what happens is that the land is exhausted. And as working as sharecroppers, they are tilling land and planting crops and not yielding the crops nor getting fair wages for the work that they are getting. So the newspapers, the black newspapers are telling them about the different industries that are beginning to uh, uh, emerge. And here on the train, you see them looking at the smokestacks. This is a whole new lifestyle. This is a whole new promise of quote unquote, freedom, democracy, the possibility of maybe, maybe a better life for me, my family, and to create new communities. Why did they leave the South? No food. Notice the disparity in the composition, plain washed surfaces. Jacob Lawrence is now at the point where he has become one of the most important modernist artists who are talking about a new aesthetic style of creating images. No one is creating the comprehensive range of storytelling, narrative, and documentary that Jacob Lawrence is doing. Jacob Lawrence created this series, a migration series, and I'm only selecting several images um, in, in, in panels that amass the number of 60. And in these 60 panels, he and his wife put them together. They went to the Schomburg and they studied, they, they made their notes clear. And then they came home and he drew out the composition the style on each one. And then Jacob Lawrence has a very interesting style. He would then start with all maybe the reds and then he would start with the yellows and then he would start with the blues and then he would start with the greens. So that by the time he was finished doing this series, it was what we call a cohesive narrative, unparalleled at this time in American history. The other thing is, is that each panel, if you ever get to see this series, has its own narrative that he and his wife created. So he did not want you to miss the fact and the point of what this particular panel, this particular story that he was focusing on, what it's like to be hungry.
Sometimes a family, if they were lucky, would have one loaf of bread to share for the week, for the week. So you see the disparity, the leanness in the composition, the washing, you know, the surface of the wall is not smooth. He is so clever in the way he recreates wood. And you see this woman leaning diagonally, slicing the bread, one candle in this space, in this humble space, house, shack that they were living. Opportunities for education, limited, if at all available in some parts of the South. Because if they did not have a school built for students who were of color, then of course there was no education available. Now, the picture of the Schomburg Library was also very important because in the history of slavery, when the Africans were brought, one of the mandates was do not teach them to read or write because if they learn how to read or write, they might have the impetus to flee, to find freedom, to leave the plantations, the horrors of what they were experiencing. So this is another reason why there are educational disparities even to this day, which exist from the culture and the lifestyle and the, and, and, and the attitudes that are still prevalent in our society today that come from what I call plantation culture. Jacob Lawrence was very attuned to what happened to the students who came to the North during the Great Migration and during the Great Depression, because these students were then allowed to go to school. They were then allowed to go to after school programs for cultural enrichment. So education was paramount. And education, even as Carter D. Woodson was creating Negro History Month, was critical to the great migration and the reasons why people left the South. Why else did they leave the South? They left the South because of violence, because of the horrors of the KKK, because of the random lynchings, uh, beatings, uh, torture, harassment that constantly occurred within Black communities in the South. And I might say, in the North as well. The disparity in the conversation, in the composition is the leanness within the terrain, the loneliness of this figure who sits in mourning of someone that they knew, probably most especially a family member who was for no reason at all, except the night Riders deciding that they needed some quote unquote fun that evening, came out and chose or came upon a lone African-American walking along the road, as we have seen in our recent history, and was targeted and made to be someone who was potentially a felon in their minds, in the horrors of their own nightmares and daymares. And so they lynched this individual. The deaths the funerals, the mournings. This is something that just still continues today. It is absolutely almost incredulous, except that when you examine the wholeness of our American history, you will see and realize the perpetuation of these kinds of systems that Jacob Lawrence talked about in his day and in his time and was the cause and rationale for people to walk, ride, run, flee from the South. These were very, very difficult times. And I would say they're difficult times in their time, but we are also facing difficult times in our times now, surrounding around the same conditions of social injustice, of cultural misunderstanding of attacks and maligning of character. You have to understand that this whole system of slavery and plantation culture was predicated on the fact of the dominant culture 
defining African Americans, Native Americans, Latinos, Asians, as people who were subhuman, non-human. So it was okay to dismiss, diminish, abuse, erase, forget, negate these individuals as human beings. That's my why we must go back to a concept of whole history, as Jacob Lawrence was telling us in, in his paintings years ago. It is amazing how on point Jacob Lawrence was, again, from the migration series. Why were they leaving? Because laws were created to protect the white dominant class, entitled and privileged. They were created to create so-called laws which police could use to create infractions upon the community, the society, and the individuals so that they could remove these individuals from the workforce, from the community, from their families, disrupting a humane way of life. Jacob Lawrence deliberately creates an image with a policeman as an X symbol where he literally encompasses the entire picture frame to say, our entire world, our entire community, our entire reality is consumed with this oppression relentlessly. Today, we finally have three men found guilty of hate crimes in federal court. How many federal crimes have been created way before we had so-called laws to address this? So these are things that were constant in the mind of Jacob Lawrence in 1941. And here today, again, from the migration series, we sit in the hands of justice in courts where many of you administer services and facilitate the processing of so-called criminals, some real criminals, but most of these I would assess are damaged human beings. They are abused, centuries of abuse, which have been carried on through generations. Our problems are, are real, they are constant. And one of the things that I feel are, are the uh, essence of art is that art is an essential part of life. What, what was Jacob Lawrence trying to do? He was trying to address the ideals of, of justice and fairness. And, and through the arts, people are more willing to engage these kinds of conditions and be able to address them because the role of the artist in society is to see how to make a better, more quality-based life. The artists and the cultural institutions also help to overcome economic crisis when we get into recessions and depressions. We have ways and means. Artists are right brain people. Yes, God knows we can be a little weird, but we don't tend to be malevolent, vicious, or violent. What we do is, is we problem solve. We find ways of looking at the ordinary, the plain, hidden in plain view, symbols and signs, where people can relate to them. We address in our work, the economics, the healthcare disparities, the political disparities, social, cultural, and all of the disparities that come with trying to live a life and support your family. We build communities. We build communities. Arts build communities. We reinvest in the dynamic of how to make an economy and a community come back. And finally, and not the least, is that we strengthen the priority to see ourselves as the common, what is the common good for this nation? You know, we have the constitution and we have the bill of rights. What does that mean? It means that artists and the arts 
are looking for a ways and means to have a humanistic, a human quality of life for all people. And even though Jacob Lawrence focused the most of his narrative work, most of his documentary and, and brilliant paintings on African-American history, what he was saying is that we are part of the whole history of America because America was not built without the labor and the presence of African-American genius. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Professor Hammond, uh, for that. Um, next up, we're going to have some perspectives from a court management standpoint. And Michael's going to start us off with his perspective on arts and justice from a judicial educator's perspective, based upon mm -hmm. what Dr. Hammond has shared. Well, I'm de delighted to be here to spend some time talking with you about Jacob Lawrence uh, from a perspective that you might find uh, somewhat unique, which is from the perspective of art and justice. The importance as an educator is how we deliver our content, how we, de how we design our content, who our audience is, the, the different levels of our audiences. We really are very specific in how we address education. Art is a powerful doorway to having these dialogues on complex conversations around race, uh, inequities in our justice system. So I want you to think about it for a moment, the power of art and how it can shift the dialogue. Think about the Obama portraits. Think about what has happened in the nation when the first black president and the first black lady uh, invested in two African-American artists. Um, and you can remember, if you don't recall, the power of those images where one child who was photographed staring at Michelle Obama in awe about the power of what our art can communicate and what it tells people about themselves and whether or not they are validated, whether or not they are recognized, whether or not they are seen, whether or not they are acknowledged. This is really important that art, in a sense, really matters at a real substantive way and an emotional way uh, bringing us together. Critically here, and when we think about art, I want you to think about art in terms of the criminal justice system, in terms of our places where we come, the institutions of the courthouse. In our courthouse are the stories of the people who come into our courthouse reflected in our collections. Do we see ourselves represented there uh, in the portraits? Uh, in the uh, sculptures, uh, in the, even in the names of our buildings? Do we see ourselves represented? And what is the power of representation when you come into a courtroom or non-representation when you're not represented? What does that say to you? How does that validate you? What does it mean if you are a white person and you see a, a panel of justices that go back to the 1800s? and they all look exactly like you. What does that sell you about the justice system at an unconscious way, right? Not at necessarily conscious. What does that tell you about yourself? What does that tell an African-American, a Latinx person about him or herself and whether or not they are, whether or not they belong uh, in that place? And so when we see art as an educator through the lens of education, it is a possibly a doorway to reconnect to reinvest in communities that often don't see themselves as being seen or heard. L let me think about Jacob Lawrence in this context. His migration series captures the, the criminal justice system. Uh, it captures the ways in which that system uh, was, has been oppressive, the ways in which that system has not worked fairly and equitably for all, all folks. But what his work actually does is says, there's a doorway to have a conversation about our system. So he is a critic, he is an observer, but he's also saying there's an opportunity to acknowledge our inequities. So think about 
what we can do and how we can look at our various sort of ways in which we represent people uh, in our various courtrooms, in our justice system. Uh, in California, where I'm based, there's been a lot of effort put into the courthouses in terms of finding spaces and places that represent children. So we have a corner in some of the courthouse for children. There's children's art. It reflects the children who come into the court so they can see themselves, either if they're going through an adoption process or if they're going through a unification process or if they're talking, uh, you know, meeting with a social worker or a psychologist on site. They have art in the room, and that is to connect those children. It's to calm them down. It is to actually say to them, it's going to be OK. The art reflects who they are and sometimes what their challenges are. As, as adults, we need the same thing. We also pine, and we want that reflection and that identification. And I think one of the things that I'm going to encourage you to do, and I think this is part of the process that we have to be engaged in, is to figure out how we as educators, people who are administration, uh, who people who have the responsibility for our various courthouses, how can we conduct an equity audit of our art collections? So in our buildings, what does our art look like? How can we form a committee or a work group to actually assess whether or not women are represented, whether or not Latinx folks or Latinos, Mexican Americans, African Americans, whether or not they're represented. Once we begin to do that audit, we can probably find out fairly quickly that we are not fully representing the diversity within our co respective communities. And I argue in our, art com in our art collections that even if we live in a community that's not diverse, let me tell you a secret. Diversity is coming to a town near you. And so you might as well be ready uh, and be prepared to be engaged uh, in that process. And lastly, and I'm going to shift it over to my colleagues. In California, where I do a, the, much of my work, um, every year I curate an art show of African-American artists in the San Francisco Bay Area. And we bring together at least sometimes from four to 15 artists per year. And we install those artists in the state building where the Supreme Court is located. And thousands of people get exposed and get validated when they walk into that building. What is so wonderful, it's very intentional on my part, is that the artists that I'm primarily exposing to are African American artists, African artists from the African diaspora, and I even expose them to other artists who are influenced by the African American experience or the African experience. Why is that important? Because even people who work in the building want to be validated. Even the staff want to see themselves reflected. Um, the corner of the world that I work in, in judicial education, is quite exciting, and I love what I do. But I was lastly most inspired. We had an artist come two years ago, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, right around the time of COVID, when COVID began to really take off. And the governor of California came down and saw her work and said, I want to put her in my collection. That would have never happened if the governor's staff had not seen her work in the building. And um, that was never my intention. The governor are not tight. You know, we don't hang like that. We don't roll like that. But, uh, but the fact of it is how exposure expands. The Supreme Court in California mm -hmm. came down to me, the, the California Supreme Court said, Michael, can we talk to some of the artists so we can add some of these pieces to our Supreme Court <laughs> collection? That would have never happened, that a Supreme Court staff would reach out to me to say, can we add that to our collection? Because our collection had no, has no African Americans, no Latinx, no one represented. So I wanted to put the importance of thinking about your collections, the importance of having the, the faces of people represented in your building and what that says to them and to the community uh, uh, about them. Let me stop. Well, that's a great point, Michael. And I will tell you, as, court, as a court manager, 
um, in my district, which is comprised of 14 counties and 23 Superior Court judges, um, we're currently constructing two new justice centers. And what you don't know is we've been talking for about uh, at least three times over the past month and a half, and I was became more conscious of art and our courts. And so at least from a court management perspective, I now can have a say-so as the lead person in the bidding process and who gets to bid with how, the, how we select the art in the courthouses. And so that some diversity is reflected in those photos that are being purchased as a part of the process. And so maybe that's something for you to think about. Even if you're in a historic courthouse, uh, as a court manager, depending on where you are, you, you do have influence in that area. Um, and so Edwin, I want to go to you from a national perspective. Um, what are your thoughts? Well, it's um, the entire conversation is very interesting, <clears throat> excuse me, especially as it relates to the intersection of art and justice. Frequently artists, and I know we have at least one in here who's handy with a, a camera, I'm looking at him, um, but, but artists have some innate ability to connect with their surroundings and to connect with um, rudimentary dealings of life. And Jacob Lawrence does just that. Um, as depicted in a number of his uh, 60 different panels, the Great Migration, in particular, the one that was up on screen where you had, um, if you could tell, a judge, you know how judges are generally elevated in the courtroom and looking down at two persons, uh, appeared to be a white judge, two black or African Americans in front of them. And we have to have some understanding as to how the people on the other side view justice. Uh, and, and, and so I'll, I'll share this with you. Um, you know, I've worked in, in several different judicial facilities where, you're right, the artwork does not necessarily depict the community in which we serve. And I've come from some, some pretty diverse communities. But um, I recognize that historically, um, our judicial system uh, has not been very diverse overall. And so when these buildings and grand halls and justice centers are created and built, they're not created and built with others in mind. Generally speaking, they're created and built um, with the thoughts and ideas of those people who are in power. And so, you know, there's this thing that the, the art tells me and speaks to me where I need to have some empathy and some understanding. And, and, and we talk about this a lot. I don't know how many of you are familiar with an ongoing endeavor called the Blueprint for Racial Justice. We've got all states and territories and chief justices and justices and some trial court administrators and AOC directors and local and other local officials involved in that effort. And it's a heavy lift because you're trying to get people to wrap around their minds some thoughts and ideas and perspectives of others that may not share the same thoughts and ideas and perspectives. And so when you talk about art, you know, how it's depicted, you know, there's some, I would say it's fictional art where it's just a, a mental exercise of the artist who has some ideas and, and lays them out. Um, Mr. Lawrence had some non-fictional art where his artwork depicted actually what was going on in the world around him. And even to depict some of those images at the time he did it, could have quite frankly been dangerous for him, especially for it to get out. And especially had Harlem not evolved to be what it was due to the real estate issues and not being able to, to get uh, predominantly white residents to move into those, those buildings and those apartments and such. And so ultimately over time, if any of you have traveled to New York City and have had an opportunity to visit Harlem World, you'll, you'll um, sort of get that sense of community that's there. And the gentrification is underway right now, of course, because uh, it costs a lot of money to live in New York City. But, but when you tie art to people and what it represents, the hope is that those who are viewing the art pieces 
again, develop that empathy and feel somewhat proximate, right? Somewhat close to what's being de depicted for if nothing else but to develop an understanding um, and, and some comfort. Because the reality is, as we talk about this in the context of art and justice, these discussions can be very uncomfortable for people. And I will share this with you. Just because I identify as black doesn't mean it's any more comfortable for me than it would be for one of my colleagues who identifies as white. And so, but these are conversations that have to happen and never end. And it's challenging because there are some people who've been at this work a lot longer than any of us. And it's very difficult for them to keep going because they don't necessarily feel or see meaningful progress. And I can tell them the fact that the three of us are sitting up here uh, uh, is progress. Dr. Hammers, that's progress. And so when we talk about what Mr. Lawrence portrayed, labor issues, housing issues, other justice related issues, we can immediately, if we're being honest with ourselves, connect that to 2022 and the issues that remain in this country. All of you are here because you are tied in and connected to the judicial system of your respective jurisdiction. And so I would say that each of us have a particular responsibility to ensure that the work that we do is proximate to the people in which we serve, not just process driven. We run into that a lot when we're um, developing processes. In fact, I had a, a person reach out to me a number of months ago, and I'll say I've always fancied myself as a, a person who was on the inside, you know, working to do things a little bit better. And this person challenged me um, a number of months ago. I've been in this role now slightly over a year, about 14 months or so, 14, 15 months. And he said, you're part of the problem. And it caught me off guard. And I, because I felt that I was a knowledgeable person. Clearly, you know, I'm an African American man. Um, I'm trying to do the right things. I work and navigate and weave, bob and weave within our respective systems and try to get things done. But here is a person on the outside of the judicial system who didn't know me from Adam and made that particular comment to me. And so I had to be introspective in, in, in regards to the realization that because we might not be doing anything wrong and because we might be trying we, to do the right things, other people who are impacted by the systems in which we operate may not see it that way. And so we have to be intentional about the things we do. Artwork is one thing, it's very simple. Courthouse, I came in, we had a, a, our meeting room um, had judges from the uh, 1700s through, I believe it was 1906, and it's full. They don't look like me, of course. No biggie, it doesn't bother me as much, at least not consciously. But it bothered judges, new, some of our newer judges, who said, you know, I'm not as comfortable in this space. And they're judges. And so you have to, say, okay, let me take a step back. I've worked in court administration for a number of years, or if I'm a judge, I've been a judge for a number of years, or a practicing lawyer, or whatever. Let me, let me take a step back and, and try to visualize what the surroundings in which we operate in, how they are, and how they connect to the people who enter those buildings. Because ultimately, they're the most important. Now, I'll say that the staff are equally important because the employees have to do the work. And these are conversations that I have right now with justices around this country, trial court judges around this country, state court administrators and trial court administrators and, and, and non-trial court administrators about the employees who operate within your facilities. If they don't feel comfortable yeah, they come to work every day. They, quote unquote, collect a paycheck. But how comfortable are they in these spaces? Because it may seem as though 
they operate here. We laugh, we giggle, we go to breakfast and lunch together. We have birthday parties. We have everything under the sun for, 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 for those of us who work in courthouses. But it doesn't necessarily mean that everyone is that comfortable operating in these spaces. And so when we're talking about art and its intersections, we should keep that in mind in our workplaces. And also because you may feel or do not feel a particular way, you, you need to take into consideration that others may have a different perspective and may feel differently than you do. Well, that's great, Edwin. Thank you for that. And a quick, quick solution to having this dialogue with these, uh, our panel and even uh, Professor Dr. Hammond um, one of the things I did, I have one of my counties that are 14 that's majority minority. And as a result of our recent communication, I mm -hmm. asked my judges in that particular jurisdiction to take a photo and their black robes uh, because they represent a large minority population uh, where they have historically seen uh, different portraits of people that don't look like them. And we had those placed in a jury room and in the law library so people could actually, the constituents that they serve could actually see those images that the judges now actually represent the community. So just a quick solution. So um, I think we have some time for questions and answers, but before we get to that, and there's a microphone that will be passed around. To ask you a question, and that is, how did Jacob Lawrence end up in Seattle? Jacob Lawrence ended up in Seattle as a result of a job offer that came from the University of Washington. At the time, there were two few opportunities that were afforded him on the East Coast. I think this is a fantastic seminar and I'm glad to see it. Um, five years ago, I started a uh, art competition and exhibition called Just Art in uh, the suburban Atlanta area. And so we have youth and adult artists that are able to enter in each, uh, I do this every two years, cause it's a lot <laughs> to put on as you know. And so we, um, first year we did Origins of Justice. And, and some of this, these ideals of children, one did a, a three dimensional figure of a bird at the top of a water source feeding <laughs> another bird below it. This was a fifth grader. And then one of our police captains, uh, sheriff ca uh, captains actually, did the adult piece and won, won first place for the adult piece. And he did the origins of justice kind of going through the Judeo-Christian cycle with Moses holding up the uh, uh, Ten Commandments. He also brought Jackie Robinson in. This was a, a, a Caucasian captain, police captain pulling in the civil rights and he had a couple other vignettes. So I can tell you that there is a strong demand internally, as you've said, I guess I'm just testifying. <laughs> there is a strong demand internally, court users, even like I said, pol uh, police, law enforcement, all the way down to our, our young citizens, our children. They have ideas of justice. And if we just invite them and these, these ideas that they have brought forth and manifested have impacted myself. And we keep them on display where we did our old courthouse. We just moved into a new one, so we're trying to install them now. But whatever you can do, like I said, it doesn't have to be every year. And so I, um, from my own pocket, and you can talk about what funds are available, curate this collection. So we buy those pieces and we keep them on display in the permit collection. Mm -hmm. So that's one way you can build, if you don't have a budget, just start off with one piece or two pieces um, every year or two years. Thank you, I'm glad you put this on. Thank you. I, I just wanna thank you. This is one of the most thoughtful uh, sessions I've ever attended. And I've been at this for a number of years and it's just so timely. Um, I wonder if the panel could talk We've talked about the artwork in the courthouse, but now I'm thinking about the branding that we have on all of our materials that go out and literature and the website. So I wonder if you could just maybe talk about those kind of opportunities as well. Let me let me start. That's a you must have read my mind. Um, one of the things that we are very thoughtful, I think you are now more thoughtful is when we do our programs, 
and we put together our materials, the cover art, there's a lot of thought that goes into the re what's reflected in the cover art. This is so important because um, the first thing they, they see in the program is, do I see myself reflected in the materials? And so that is almost very, very critical the, uh, in terms of you know, marketing your programs, putting your programs out. Uh, that, that, that's when you're just doing a program. Then when you open the program, it's what are the photos you see on the, in the agenda? You know, who, who are they look like? Do you have the right people at the table? And sometimes you can have a, the best intentions but you have these blind spots that you miss uh, an opportunity. And so you have to be very, very intentional. And sometimes what that means is you have to redo that cover, uh, reorganize uh, what that, uh, that inside looks like. And so I think in our marketing and our programming, it's, it's really, really critical that we were very thoughtful about it. And that's why I think it's good to have diverse planning committees. So when you have diverse voices, gender, sexual orientation, race, disability, if you have a diverse planning committee, you'll have someone that will hopefully catch that critical. This is important. But you have to be receptive to hearing it. So when, you, when you're laying out your program, you have to be able to say, we're going to be very intentional, and we might have to go back and revisit the design, revisit the, the look. Um, I think those are things that I'm very conscious of and very intentional about. Um, but then I get down to, as a, as a planner, I get down to who's in the faculty, you know, whether or not they are diverse. So I did a program, don't tell anybody I did this, today it would be called critical race theory, but then it was called uh, education. Um, that's, a little, that's a little dig. Um, but um, um, we did one where we had people read uh, Ernest Gaines, A Lesson Before Dying. We had a law and literature class uh, that I put together. I wanted them to read Malcolm X, but I couldn't get them to do that one. But um, we, they read the book. But we had faculty who came in in African traditional dress. That was a shocker for people, to have you know, a professor at a university and a lawyer come in in traditional dress. And so, but I wanted that. I wanted to shake up that you can present in any number of ways. Your expertise is reflected. Uh, in your dress, in your culture. In that. And so we have to be accepting of that. And so uh, clearly I have some very intentional thinking about my faculty. Uh, I'm okay with people coming as they are and who they are um, because they are valid, they are credible, they are something that we want to look at. So that's my long way of saying uh, we have to be very intentional about what we do. Is it morning or afternoon? I believe it's still it's morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I hail from North Carolina, and I too would like to echo the sentiments of uh, thanking um, you for this thoughtful session. Um, our courts have done quite a bit mm -hmm. in bringing art and justice together in a number of different mediums. It has been something that both the staff and um, the public has enjoyed. It's been primarily for our internal supports, um, but because there are many people many um, people from the public who come to our courthouse, some have had the benefit of, of seeing our artistry. Um, two things, one, we um, um, exhibited a soil collection. Um, the Equal Justice to Institute has a campaign in which they are collecting soil of lynchings that have occurred across our country. Um, one lynching occurred in uh, what is now the Bank of America Stadium in Charlotte, North Carolina. We had court officials, elected officials, myself, part of that um, excavation, and we exhibited that mm -hmm. in our courthouse. Um, secondly, we have a group um, that is hopefully and faithfully working toward that lynching being a permanent part of our courthouse. Mm -hmm. um, Brian Stevenson, and as you may be familiar with Cheryl Eiffel, talk about on the courthouse lawn, yes. because many of the early lynchings bodies were drugged to a public place yeah. so that they could be seen and intimidate the community. So we believe that the courthouse plays a central role in justice and injustice and in distributing or making that um, public for internal 
and the public is um, something mm -hmm. that we're very committed to. So thank you for this. Thank you. And I'll say, um, I always love our, our elected officials from North Carolina. Um, when you talk about courthouse sort of being central, courthouses have always, at least in this country, been a, a central place for the community for various reasons. Um, good and, and, and all good to the horrible. A lynching is obviously horrible. Um, about a, a year and a half or so ago, there was a lynching marker placed in the front of the courthouse in which I uh, was formerly employed. Unbeknownst to us, we weren't given any uh, advance notice. Uh, um, but, but they're all part of it. It's, it's part of a, some of our, our histories. I had family. My great-grandfather was lynched and chopped to pieces. Um, my, my mother's grandfather. So we know that these things exist and, and have happened and have an impact on people's perspe per uh, perception of what justice is and will it be fair. And so that's why I talk about being proximate, getting to know people. As we, some of us gotten to know each other over the years. I've been a long time member of this organization. I love this organization. And sometimes when you're close in proximity to people, you have a better understanding of what their thoughts and thoughts are, and so you you when you have those understandings, what I've seen over in, over the years is that um, you even if you disagree or don't uh, share the same perspective, you're less likely to be intimidated yourself or become upset from hearing that, and that's something we've got to deal with. Um, we've got to deal with people who don't want to hear it hear certain perspectives because mm -hmm. it's not fair to them. They had nothing to do with this. They didn't write these laws. They didn't kill anybody and all this, the, all that type of speak that comes out. Um, that would probably be true for every single person in this room and who's uh, every single person watching us remotely. Uh, but you, you have to settle your mind to the fact that not everyone thinks the same. And in fact, our court, again, our courthouses um, in most jurisdictions, I don't care if it's a municipal court, a district court, a superior court, whatever, it's the, the jurisdiction's beacon. It's the jurisdiction's beacon. And so mm -hmm. since that's what courts are and what courthouses are, it's, um, it's our responsibility to do what we can to make our courthouses reflective of the communities in which we serve. So, well. Another question there. Thank you. I um, just have to say this was um, so very well presented. Um, and what um, I find captivating and so much appreciate is the fact of the art and justice coming together in understanding being seen. And I've been unfamiliar with um, Jacob Lawrence's work, but it is beautiful. And what I loved about it is a sense of hope, despite what you were showing in the starkness. And I think through the whole process, I'm from the state of Missouri, and a lot of the images that were seen during the time of Ferguson was a lot of anger, a lot of um, expression of pain in negative ways. And when we met um, at a point of social injustice again, when there was rioting, um, where I live in St. Louis, I was literally down the street from the police department. And for 24 hours straight, it was nothing but the sound of war, glass breaking, things being set on fire, you know, just listening to this. And I did not sleep that night. And when I woke up the next day to go to work, um, I serve a community where there is probably less than 1% that is a minority. And for the first time in my life, I had to really take it in and think about what I did and why I do it. And I literally put, woke up, put, I mean, I, I was already up. I got dressed crying. I cried and I thought, mm -hmm. how do I show up? to a place where I work, where I believe that I make a difference. How do I show up? And I cried all the way to my mother's house. And I was like, I need to hug her. 
because she was a woman who raised me during a difficult time when Mm -hmm. she had to show papers to show where she lived in the 70s because they didn't think that a black person can own a home in that community. I had to hug her because she Mm -hmm. was my foundation. She was the one that was a beacon of light. And it hurt every time I turned on the news to hear somebody say that the foundation that was laid before me didn't matter, Mm -hmm. that I was still a victim, that there would never be any hope, there would never be any change. And I made a decision Mm -hmm. that day when I went to work, knowing that When I walk through this door, if they look at me, are they looking at me saying, is she a daytime, you know, positive protester or is she a rioter? Do I have to worry about she's going to burn this city Mm -hmm. hall down? You know, walking through the door of that. But what I kept in mind was my foundation, my mother, you know, even the mistakes my father made, knowing that, you know what, there's hope and somehow I'm going to make a difference. I don't care how it is, but you have to see Mm -hmm. me Mm -hmm. and seeing the art and hearing the history and and hearing, you know, and seeing even the picture of the lynching. When I looked at that picture, I thought not only that person looking at is it a loss, but am I next? You know, in what regard, you know, but the fact of hope, just that bit of color in there, that hope. Am I, I'm thinking I'm having room to breathe. And I think that that art creates that room to breathe. It creates a safe space to be able to have the conversations mm-hmm. that we may not want to mm-hmm. have, but that we need to have in the create a place of safety mm-hmm. that, hey, if I make a mistake, it's not the end. Mm-hmm. We're going to work through this together because mm-hmm. I see you differently. And I just want to thank you all mm-hmm. for presenting that and mm-hmm. thank the gentleman on the board. Thank the professor because mm-hmm. you have honored what the mm-hmm. foundation has been laid. You have honored those mm-hmm. that have lost their lives. Mm-hmm. You have honored those that came mm-hmm. over there. And even though we may not like mm-hmm. to think about it, we're sold by our own people sometimes and brought over here. So thank you for that. Thank you for representing well. Thank you for sharing your heart with us. And thank you for giving us an opportunity to think about creatively how we represent justice in this in this United States. Thank you. Thank you. What was your name? Mm-hmm. What's your name, ma'am? Your name? <clears throat> What's your name? Oh, Stacy Fields. Stacy. Mm-hmm. Thank you for having the courage to, to say what you just said. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I assure you, you're not the only one who who went to work um, wow. as yourself, um, feeling how you felt. I've been doing this since I was 22 years old, and I still oftentimes feel that way. You know, the family conversations because you represent justice and family reunions and Thanksgiving, and everyone's talking about the recent issues and what's going on in the world, and you're sitting there as a, a district court administrator trying to Say, hey, there's, this is the process, this is the system, this is what, and there's hope. And they're looking at you like, you were crazy. Uh, it's, it's a heavy mm-hmm. burden mm-hmm. to carry, particularly as a minority, mm-hmm. LBGTQ or what have you. It's just, it's, 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 it's a heavy burden. So I wanna thank mm-hmm. you for the courage to say what you just said, and you do not bear that burden alone. Mm-hmm. Next. Mm-hmm. Trish Kinlow, Tukwila Municipal Court mm-hmm. here in Washington State, and I just absolutely love this session. Absolutely, and I would love for it to be repeated at our annual conference, if that's possible, on a greater scale, because this was absolutely amazing. Um, In our court, when we built our new Justice Center, um, having art was very important. But of course, they didn't give me a budget for it. But what I did is I reached out to our local arts commission and asked them for money to um, put some of the art in our beautiful Justice Center. And so... We were fortunate enough here in Washington State that we have um, a judge who's an American Indian. He is Judge Guype um, at Kent Municipal Court, and he's an artist. Mm-hmm. And he created this beautiful piece called Diversity. You have to see it. It is amazing. And it's all in um, sign language. And it's different um, colors of hands spelling out the word diversity and different genders. And it's absolutely beautiful. And I Um, got our arts commission Mm -hmm. to pay for that to be hung in our Mm -hmm. justice center. Also, Mm -hmm. um, we have a minority and justice commission here in Washington state and every year they put out a new poster and I collected each one of those posters and had them professionally framed 
and hung throughout our justice center because I want the people who come into our justice center to know all the different elements um, that Washington State is doing in order to ensure that we have justice. Very proud of mm -hmm. Justice Gonzalez, regardless of the things he said about me. He's making huge changes. He and Justice Yu and Justice Whitener, um, and we have our first um, American Indian justice, um, Judge um, Montoya Lewis, you know, and they are making changes on the bench. But even with all having all of those prestigious people in very key positions, the battle and the struggle is still real. And so I really appreciate what you said because it is a struggle every day for people of color who are in our positions mm -hmm. to positively affect change, but still have our own personal battles within the places that we work. Absolutely. So thank you very much, especially for the people who aren't people of color That's that are great. here in this session. It means a lot to me to have you here and to hear this. Because I believe that, you know, just your presence gives some of us some hope. So thank you. And I uploaded a picture of uh, Judge Gipes' diversity to the chat if anyone wants to click on the link. Yes. I just want to say thank you for having this. I, I uh, agree with her about having this mm -hmm. also at the annual conference. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to tell you, one good way to incorporate art into courthouses and other spaces, mm -hmm. the jail and prison system are full of the most talented individuals um, you would ever want to um, see. Um, I've worked with corrections, Department of Corrections. Um, TJ is familiar with accountability courts. Um, we have a conference every year where the participants actually do artwork, poems. They submit that um, across the board and they yes. win um, prizes. Yes. But imagine yeah. if some of those pieces could be framed um, on a on a smaller scale budget and placed throughout um, to not only hear the story of how they see the justice system, but to be able to represent that in the courthouses. So just wanted to throw that out there about the talented pool of those individuals that are sitting in our prison systems mm -hmm. and our jails. Thank you, Ms. Casa. That was an excellent uh, idea. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? questions, mm -hmm. comments. All right, before I close that, I'm going to let mm -hmm. Professor Hammond, can you hear us now live? If you want to say any closing remarks mm -hmm. before I close us out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a wonderful panel. I am so glad that my colleagues invited me to do this. I am so glad that my colleagues agreed because I thought that it was important that they also part of it. And I'd like to say uh, briefly, this is a conversation, <laughs> right? This is a conversation. We're not lecturing uh, per se. This is a conversation and it's one that will be ongoing. Um, and so I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't invite everyone here and everyone within the sound of my voice to participate in the webinar that's coming up this Thursday on Courageous Conversations. Uh, uh, attorney uh, uh, Dana Cutler uh, is leading that group for us uh, as part of our blueprint for racial justice. Uh, some of you may recognize Ms. Cutler uh, as the wife of the, the, the Cutlers. Uh, they also have a television gig or did one of the court shows. Uh, and she and her husband are judges on that show. And I think it's important if you have an op uh, to, to hear the dialogue that will take place because one of the challenges we have is even engaging in meaningful conversation in a productive way. So if you have an, op an, an opportunity to register, it's free, of course, and to listen in on that webinar this coming Thursday, uh, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Edwin. I will briefly say two things in closing. How does this relate to NACOM Corps? public trust and confidence. And the last thing I want to remind you of is what Just, Justice Gonzalez said uh, on uh, his opening uh, mm -hmm. welcoming, is that art matters. And he was speaking specifically to justice and his seven-year-old son mm -hmm. seeing and understanding at that age that no one in that courthouse looked like him. So we thank you. We'll be here if you have questions, and hopefully Judah will have us back at the annual. <laughs> thank you very much. Mm -hmm.